Welcome to notes 3.3 for U.S. history. These are war comes to the U.S. whether we want it or not. So remember we were trying to stay isolationist, but we're going to end up in war anyway. So let's go ahead and review some of the U.S. involvement prior to 1941, because 1941 is when we actually end up in war with Germany and Japan. But before that, we were isolationist and we were neutral, for the most part. Remember, we were trying to stay that way, but we also had some other things that happened. So there are a few different neutrality acts that happened during this time period. The Neutrality Act of 1935, which made it completely illegal to sell arms, weapons to any country that was at war at the time. And so we passed that in 35, but in 37, we passed that cash and carry idea. And remember, the cash and carry is, we'll sell non-military supplies to you on a cash and carry basis. The countries pay cash for it and they transport it. Then in 1939, we changed this a little bit more. We can sell military supplies, arms to nations at war, again, on that cash and carry. So the first one was the non-military, now it's your military supplies. Then we have our destroyers for bases deal with Britain. We also had our Lend-Lease program that comes out. We froze all Japanese assets in U.S. banks, and we had that oil embargo that we placed on Japan. So we really did choose a side. Um, we just were saying we were neutral, and we weren't actually sending troops or weapons or money unless it was getting paid for in some way, not always with cash. So the U.S. was already working towards involvement in World War II. And then in January of 1941, Franklin Roosevelt gives his famous Four Freedom speech. And he talks about freedom of speech and freedom of worship, freedom from want and freedom from fear. These four freedoms are the things that Americans fight for, that we believe in, that we find worth fighting for. And so he's really kind of preparing Americans to join World War II, urging them to do that, because FDR really had this idea of internationalism, not isolationism that all the countries, we were tied to the rest of the world and we needed to be involved in international affairs. So Franklin Roosevelt really was prepping the nation for war. And these four, the four freedoms, um, as well as the Atlantic Charter, which actually kind of aligned us with Britain, really sets us up as allying with Britain, but also being ready to enter the war. We're really getting ready to do that. and. You may have seen some of these pictures before as you're looking at these Four Freedoms pictures. Um, if you've heard of Norman Rockwell, who was a very famous artist in the 40s, uh, did paintings of just kind of everyday American life or average American life, and he painted the posters for the Four Freedoms. And so as you look at them, you can see your freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear, and really helped promote it to the rest of America. So Roosevelt was laying the groundwork for American involvement in World War II. Now, 1941 is a big year, so what happened then? Well, in 1941, the U.S. had already been feeling threatened by Japanese, Japan's aggressive actions in Asia. They're moving east, they're going towards American possessions in the Pacific. We were very nervous. So the U.S. was prepping for war with Japan. We knew there was this big possibility. So the U.S. actually built up a large navy and they moved it to a home base in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So the U.S. was preparing for war with Japan, so we took our entire Pacific fleet and had them set in this territory of Hawaii. Remember, it's not a state until 1950. And set up a military base and were ready just so when we did go to war with Japan, we would be ready and it would be on the right side of the world, we'd be ready to fight Japan. So the U.S. was prepared for war with Japan. And this should have been a good thing, but it actually backfired or nearly backfired on the U.S. Because Japan knew the U.S. did this. So they actually planned an attack on the U.S. Navy base at Pearl Harbor in an attempt to wipe out the entire U.S. Navy. So all of the ships were supposed to be there. All of the aircraft carriers were supposed to be there. So the plan was wipe out the entire ship, the Navy, and the planes that were on them. 
So the Japanese attack, and we see these headlines um, about what has happened. And this was before the U.S. even knew we were at war. So the people of America had not even realized we were at war. There's some question about whether the government actually had received the telegram yet or not. Officially, the statement is the U.S. government didn't know. So they, the attack happened before the U.S. was actually notified that Japan had declared war. And so Japan, Japan declared war, they bomb Oahu, Pearl Harbor, is at Oahu, sink the ships, kill hundreds, thousands of people. Um, and of course, we are very upset. Americans now are going to support the war. So December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor is bombed, and that is a date you should know, December 7th, 1941. On December 8th, 1941, the U.S. declares war on Japan. So we retaliate, we declare war on Japan. And that is not the end of us getting into war. Because remember, Japan is allied with the Axis powers of Germany and Italy. Which means just a few days later, on December 11th, they declare war on the U.S. So at the end of 1941, the U.S. policy of isolationism is gone. The U.S. is at war, not just with Japan, who attacked Pearl Harbor, but with their allies, Germany and Italy and Europe. So now we've got to fight in Asia and in Europe. So the U.S., everyone expected it to be months before the U.S. got involved, before the U.S. was able to help. But the U.S. surprised the entire world because we mobilized very, very quickly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. There was so much public support that everyone helped that to happen. So what ended up happening, the U.S. was already so industrialized, the factories literally just shifted their assembly line production from civilian things like, say, cars to tanks or airplanes or things like that, so d directly into military supplies. And the men who had been working in the factories joined the military, so women and minorities went and took over their jobs. So more and more people got involved, we had more minorities working, we had men joining the military, and this is really what ends the last effects of the Great Depression. This is the only time in American history where a war fixes the economy. Generally it costs more money to be at war, and so it actually hurts the economy, but World War II is what finally ends the Great Depression for America. The U.S. government also got involved in helping the war effort and helping convert businesses into war production. So they actually created some specific agencies at the na national agencies like the War Production Board or WPB, Remember, FDR loves those acronyms, those letters, alphabet soup, back from the New Deal. Um, the War Production Board is created to help set priorities and production goals, control distribution, um, and to really help with getting production started and getting more of what the military needed out there. So helping make those choices. And one of the things they did to try to gain more support is they used propaganda. And we're going to look at a lot of propaganda in class, but they used propaganda to try to get, garner support for the war efforts, whether it was rationing or war production or um, saving, uh, joining the military, whatever it was, they used propaganda for that. Now, often the War Production Board and the military would actually run into conflicts with one another. They didn't always agree. So FDR actually created another agency to try to stop these conflicts and try to mitigate those, mediate them. The other agency that FDR created is called the Office of War, War Mobilization, and they really, like I said, helped with conflicts between the War Production Board and the military. Now, even with the entire country at work, whether it's in the military or at production, not enough goods could be produced to supply the war effort. So this actually led to even more rationing, more government programs that were going to help gain American support for the war efforts in their everyday life. So you get propaganda, you get things about canning all you can and growing victory gardens and promising to work hard to help and do your part, share the meat, remember? So a lot of the same things we saw in World War I are going to come back and the propaganda is really going to push this. They also create the Office of Price Administration, or the OPA. 
Their purpose is to limit the effect of food shortages on inflation. So they're trying to stop inflation from happening. Remember, that's when prices rise because you have a limited amount of what you want. And so they're trying to limit the effect on price shortages and keep food amounts stable or food desires stable, maybe what people want. So the idea was that every American family was on a ration and the OPA actually created ration books. You can see one here. This is for fuel oil. Um, but you had different rations for different things. And so you had to use your little coupons to buy the food or oil or whatever it was. And so if you didn't have a coupon, you couldn't buy it. So you got so many a month. And when you ran out, you couldn't get more. So if you look at some of the propaganda that was there to help push this and keep Americans supporting the war effort, have you really tried to save gas, um, stretch your sugar, don't use as much, try to use a little less of it, try to figure out ways to use less, keep the home front pledge, only pay prices, only buy with ration stamps. So be a good American and do these things. There was a lot of propaganda during this time promoting that. And the idea behind that is this double V campaign. The V's stand for victory. And we're looking at victory at home and victory abroad. So you can help us win the war if you help the war effort, if you give support to the war effort, if you do what the government's asking. And so the idea was to really pull Americans in and make all Americans, not just the military, support the war effort. And so now that we were in the war, America was pulling together and supporting the war effort. So that actually ends Notes 3.3. .3. Our next set of Notes, Notes 3.4, will talk about minorities at war and how the minorities in the U.S., both at work in the U.S., like women and other minorities, and in the military, helped the U.S. with the war effort. So that's what we'll look at in Notes 3.4, but this is the end of Notes 3.3.